welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast with me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. Getting called out in the middle of the night to go carve a cow to do a cesarean. It's the closest thing to farming you can do in the middle of Bristol. And then mum's on YouTube and then now it's there for the world to see, so it's great. But England were very chirpy. And I think I only cried like four times, but they just happened to get all four times on camera, okay? <laughs> Lock myself in a procedure room. <laughs> whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows I'm a little bit stupid. I love people and I love cricket. Suddenly I'm out on a helicopter because I can go on a glacier. And... This has been the longest year ever, hasn't it? <laughs> My dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. So I learned the anthem because I really genuinely thought they would make us sing it. So Polly, busy week for you. You moved house? I did. It was, um, do you know what? It wasn't as stressful as I expected. Um, uh-huh. I had some help from two brilliant friends who were were very strong and could help lift all my stuff, which was good. Um, so yeah, I've been living in paradise for a week. Um, paradise being, being still Manchester. Um, but no, I, as you can probably tell, like I'm just so much happier day-to-day life is a lot easier I'm sleeping I'm eating normally like I actually can cook now um yeah just everything is a lot simpler which is good it doesn't feel like you're you're trying to sleep in the corner of the hacienda club well indeed (laughs) that's a good way of putting it Um, for elderly listeners I put that reference in (laughs) do that and and mancunians might know it but yes Yes, I, I, speaking of Mancunians, I heard you on BBC Radio Manchester this week. Just doing the rounds, you know. Yeah, I was uh, on a 10-minute interview about women's football this time. But I loved I loved the way the, I mean, the interview. And, and, and now it's going to be Polly Starkey talking to us. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, sounded great. So, yeah, if, you, if listeners want to... Um, Listen to it. It's still there on BBC Sounds, Radio Manchester, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Um, there is Polly completely bluffing her way in women's football for 15 minutes. Excuse me. I know what I'm on about. I said Manchester United had no history. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how to make friends and influence people in Manchester. <laughs> well, to be fair, it's funny because um, the two people that present it... Emily, she is a City fan and Gaz is a United fan, so it balances quite well. Uh, but mm. what I said was was true because yeah. Manchester United women in their reformed situation... Fine, fine. Really- it's a cricket podcast, Paul. You don't need to explain. Don't need to justify myself. Well, I'm going to have to cut that out. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know what I'll do? I'll say I'll cut the part where it says I'm going to have to cut that out, but I'm going to leave that part in. I'll just cut what we said so then everyone's like oh what did they say it's probably something awful and it's not even that bad right anyway on to some serious cricket chat it has been a good week for Nigeria who beat Uganda in the African games to win bronze and Zimbabwe who beat the South African development side in the final it went to a super over and Zimbabwe got gold wow well done Zimbabwe absolutely amazing that's 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 brilliant isn't it I mean Zimbabwe They've had a series against Ireland recently and Mm -hmm. uh, struggled a little bit in that. But what a great win um, that is um, for them. And then Nigeria as well. Not a country we hear very much about in women's cricket. But I just think there's amazing statistics about Nigeria. Like by the year 2050, one in 10 babies born will be born in Nigeria. Just uh, crazy stuff about Nigeria as a country, as a population, as a, a growing global influence. So, yeah, you can only expect that that will have um, a sort of cricket spin-off as well. And uh, there's no particular reason why Nigeria shouldn't have cricket played there, um, you know, in terms of its history and and so on, you know, for the maybe the sort of French-speaking African countries, you'd expect there wouldn't be so much of a connection to cricket. But for Nigeria, um, it's brilliant to see that developing and there's loads of potential there. Yeah, it was really interesting. So thank you to Hypercost for that information because sometimes it's difficult to follow cricket. I mean, we struggle to follow the WPL and that's, you know, that's on Sky Sports. So um, following the African games is even even harder than that. Um, it's been... 
a mixed week, actually. I think a mixed week for the counties who have had to submit their applications for Project Darwin. Now, Durham are looking like they will get the northeast one, and we've spoken about this before, and Yorkshire are kind of the natural... Um, yeah, they, I mean, they're the biggest county there. You would expect them to get it, but it's looking likely that it could be Durham, and they, they did an amazing video um with Ben Stokes and yeah I, I I think the point I really like that they made and which other counties I get why they've done it but it's also I kind of roll my eyes a bit is Durham was saying you know we're here now but actually we want to build for the future and other teams have banked on that the fact they've have historically have a lot of women's cricket and it's like yeah well you can have that history but you can be doing absolutely nothing now um, and actually saying, do you know what? We haven't got this big past, this big history, but we want to invest in the future and we've got this really good plan of how we're going to do it. That to me is a lot. I mean, I'm not one of the dragons that they're pitching it to, but if you tell me this is this is our plan for the future rather than being like, yeah, like we, we did loads in the past. Um, we haven't got much of a plan now, but we, we, we did loads before, so we must be good. Um I think it's a it's a more credible argument to to have a solid plan of what you're going to do in the future. Yeah, I, I think both and, isn't it? So so to have a great track record is good. Uh, but if you've got a tra- great track record, but no vision for how things are going to be, then that could be problematic when it comes to pitching your project, if you like. There's a really good article about this in The Guardian this week, wasn't there, by a friend of the pod, Raph Nicholson, uh, the doctor herself. Um, really, really uh, worth reading. And in that, saying that there are only two counties who've not uh, gone into this. So Worcestershire, we already knew about Derbyshire is the other one. So 16 other counties. I, uh, MCC weren't mentioned, actually. So I assume MCC mm. have not gone in for it either. Well, there was an interesting thing about MCC, like a almost joint thing with Middlesex, I think. Oh, OK. And they did okay. clarify that it you know, this isn't joint because they're not allowed to do joints because essentially mm. that's the regions if they, like, pair, pair up. But because the MCC, and I didn't understand it, but anyway, it's it's fine. It's... MCC might be in there. I mean, that, that would be awesome. amazing. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so there's going to be a big Dragon's Den style uh, set of um, presentations happen over three days, I think, in uh, later this month. And that's going to be the opportunity for them to pitch to some top brass from the ECB, but also some other people from outside of cricket who are going to be involved in that, particularly people from women's football. And you look at the development that's gone on in domestic women's football over the last uh, three years, particularly, and it's been quite astonishing how that has grown. And uh, so it's really interesting to have that input and those voices in the selection of domestic women's cricket going forward. Yeah, I completely agree. And it is an interesting point about external people being used, because I think on one hand, cricket is it has quite specific needs, I think. And so it's good to have people who understand cricket. But at the same time, I think cricket kind of needs to learn from other sports. And obviously, sometimes I think it's reluctant to do that because it is so set in its ways, and to some extent, I agree with that. Um, but having experts, so I think um, Kelly Simmons from the F, that like she used to be head of the FA, I think she's involved. Um, and so, in terms of strategy, building team identity, that sort of thing, that side is what football has nailed. Um, so, I think that will be quite interesting. Now, one point, and you mentioned uh, Raf's article, one point I wanted to raise. Was there's a part in the piece where it says I'll get the actual thing up so it's accurate, and it says um, that about women's teams using uh, grounds like the Oval and Lords, and it says, but the Guardian understands that some counties intend for the women to play their matches on club and school pitches, claiming that existing county grounds are already at capacity. Or village I've... greens, maybe. I... <laughs> well the first thing that sprung to my mind was Welbeck and we know where that's going to go Welbeck bingo <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think for me this is a massive problem because if you're 
say I'm one of the dragons, if you're trying to convince me you deserve to have one of these eight teams and you're being like, oh, actually, we can't host them, but we've got some great waterlogged uh, club pitches they can use, I think they'd be excellent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not like... Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's probably going to be rained off and sometimes you'll be playing on a sheep field, but it's it's all right for the women, isn't it? Like, that, that's not convincing to me. You can sugarcoat these school pitches as much as you want, but at the end of the day, it's not Lords, it's not the Oval, it's not Headingley, it's it's not Chesley Street. You know, if you if you're gonna, uh, I suppose, yeah, if you're gonna say you're committed to women's cricket, and then be like, oh, we're actually full because our men's team are here. Our men's team are our biggest priority. We don't really care about the women's team, so we're gonna shove them to an outground. It's I don't I don't understand it, and I don't understand why. I mean, I, I appreciate their honesty, but also, I mean, they could have just lied and said, they're not encouraging that, but they could have lied and said, yeah, yeah, we're going to host them at the, the main ground every week. But cause I don't understand why they think an argument saying, oh, we're going to have it at club grounds and school grounds. Why is that appealing? And why does that think, why does that make you as a county stand out compared to these other ones? Um, I, I guess that there are logistical issues for some counties, aren't there? So yeah. you look at Warwickshire, for example, and if they, you know, it's probably logistically not possible for them to run a full men's programme and a full women's programme at Edgebaston for a whole summer. Therefore, some games from the men and from the women have to go elsewhere. Now, Warwickshire, I think, I don't have many other options in terms of other grounds. Mm. There's the Edgebaston Foundation ground, um, which is not really fully suitable uh, for a, 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 a domestic game. It's, it, so it, that could be developed further in order to make it more suitable, um, but it's not. And then you've got cl uh, club grounds like Moseley, um, uh, which again, is just, it's just a, it's, it's club ground similar to Welbeck, I guess, um, uh, probably less developed than Welbeck is. So do you look to develop uh, more outgrounds? Now, this is what Thunder have done, of course, with their, with their Preston development is that they're developing an outground which won't be ready for another couple of years but um but the, yeah the Farrington project there is looking to develop something which is very much tailored for the women's game um and for sort of second 11 cricket and and so on but a, a proper um infrastructure there stadium there um which will do the job really really nicely um but someone like Warwickshire, I, I can't think off the top of my head, and I'm, you know, we are local to there, um, exactly where they would go. I mean, maybe there are, you know, grounds out towards Leamington Spa or places like that. I, I don't know. I just don't know. But again, you, you, you're kind of then going further out from, from the the kind of city centre of it, aren't, aren't you? In in Birmingham, uh, where where there's a major population and where lots of your fans are going to be. Yeah, and I wanted to kind of make a point about club grounds because I'm not anti-club grounds. I mean, you mentioned about the Farrington project, but of course in Lancashire, Blackpool, that's been amazing. And, and Lancashire men play there. And is it Southport as well that they play? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they're, they're really good grounds. The issue I have with club, club grounds is not just the pitches, it is the facilities. And I think I've noticed this from... Obviously, we yeah we've spoken about well back from like a commentary perspective as well. So, for example, I went to Mosley last year and the game was called off because of rain, and that was genuine rain. It was torrential. Um, but where we were supposed to be commentating was in a corridor, looking out of a window, um, not in line with the wicket. It was like off a weird angle, right outside the players' changing room. And firstly, that's not really appropriate. Secondly, it's just really inconvenient. Um, and it's like, well, I think with these counties, it's kind of maybe not the last shot, but I think it's they want this to stick. You know, we're, we don't want to change this in five years. We want this to be the final thing. So I know it's difficult to get everything perfect and they won't get everything right. But I think doing as much as you can to prof professionalise it on all levels and increase the quality on all levels, I think is really important. And so making sure things like, you know, there's room for physio beds. The changing rooms are a bit big enough. They've got places where the players can eat beforehand. Like really basic things, which just make it professional, really. Um, and so I think some club grounds are equipped to do that. 
with some regions and counties will have them and I guess they'll they'll include that in their bid but yeah as you say Warwickshire perhaps not I mean I do like Edgbaston Foundation Ground but I don't know if it's fully equipped if 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 we're gonna kind of take this to the next level of professionalism because what we've got is good at the moment but I guess the plan with Project Darwin is fully professional really strong academies a really good setup and it you know it doesn't strike me as that would be the case with these club grounds yeah I mean I, I guess with with a little bit of investment you could turn uh, the foundation ground at Edgebuster into something a bit like Loughborough uh you know you'd sort of get some you know, porter lose in porter cabin toilets the tents and that sort of thing and and uh and multicolored deck chairs is what I remember from that ground and 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 that would kind of work but again that's ta- that's kind of stepping back in time rather than forward to to where the game is is heading so i i guess the farrington project it seems to me is is the sort of thing that other counties need to be thinking about where they don't have um outgrounds and again that maybe that's for durham that's that's a challenge isn't it because they have chesterley street i don't know where durham's other outgrounds are and what sort of infrastructure they'd have whereas yeah. something like yorkshire you've got scarborough as well as um headingley and you know maybe a couple of other sort of fairly decent grounds that they could use as well what i was wondering and i, I actually should have checked this or figured this out because of course, Durham are actually merged in the women's game with Northumberland. So it's the Northeast Warriors. So whether they could use Northumberland. So I know um, South Northumberland Cricket Club. I'm pretty sure that's where Amy Campbell grew up playing. That's got decent facilities, I think. Um, but I don't know if Durham would be allowed to go into Northumberland territory. Um, but if the women's county exists as that, then perhaps that could be... I, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, but um, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be against it. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't be against it. Um, but again, just Project Darwin is quite interesting in that aspect. That you know, you've got players at Northern Diamonds right now who live in Leeds or Sheffield, and potentially they're going to be off to Durham, um, which is a bit of a move. And I, I don't know how it will all work with what all players' contracts just be terminated because I'm pretty sure for example Lauren Winfield Hill has a year after like Project Darwin she has a year left on her contract at Northern Diamonds so is she like obliged to stick around or will she lose her contract like I'm intrigued to see how it all works and yeah where how players end up going all over and stuff like that with relocations so yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I guess if, if anyone knows the legalities of this, it would be interesting to to find out, um, you know, that are the these new counties, completely new legal entities, are um, contracts that have been offered previously transferable? Is all the money coming from the ECB anyway? Mm-hmm. And to what extent uh, do the, have the counties got free reign in, in employing who they want? Is, does everyone become a free agent and you have a kind of, Super draft of oh yeah, should we do a draft live on yeah. Sky Sports? <laughs> Who knows these imagine? things? Um, yeah, greater minds than mine are, th- are thinking about it. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, saw or listened to a really interesting Sky Sports um, podcast interview with Beth Barrett Wild, which was conducted by NASA Hussein and Mike Atherton, which I thought was really interesting, and she spoke at, at length about the women's game and. Uh, about loads and loads and loads of different things and she's clearly a very 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 smart person and is one of these sort of marketing management consultant types who I don't fully understand all the words that they say um but it clearly knows what they're talking it's like when I go to a a a meeting full of very senior people uh, at work and you just kind of nod along thinking I really no idea what he's talking about half the time um but uh, really interesting it thinking about uh, for example, red ball cricket and how that might or might not fit in. Uh, so if anyone's not checked that out, I'd recommend that you uh, listen to that. Just uh, about 20, 25 minutes with Beth Barrett Wild is really, really good. How dare you recommend a rival podcast? Yeah, we're all part of the same team here, aren't we? Oh. You know, us and 
and see and the thing is i don't a... want all our listeners to suddenly commute to the sky sport because obviously we have a lot more than them so i don't want all our listeners to disappear and go after sky sports yeah yeah i mean come come back to us every friday but um i i mean sky sports won't do another women's cricket podcast for a very long time <laughs> that is true <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah anyway we've been waffling on we've still got something else to talk about uh the under 19 tri-series the squad yes. has been announced yes so they're off to sri lanka aren't they yeah so it's sri lanka under 19 australia under 19 and england under 19 um and there's kind of been a bit of discussion about the squad and personally i i'm very happy with it and in terms of um yeah i suppose selection and making sure it's got the balance of players that played in the previous under 19 World Cup who actually can't qualify for the one in January, but then younger players who perhaps have never been on an overseas tour before. Um, this is their first time in the England system. I think that balance is really good because, yeah, you could send a squad who you pretty much think are going to play in the 2025 under 19 World Cup. But, A, if they get thrashed by... Uh, Sri Lanka and Australia that's not great for confidence but also if it is their first time touring I think it's good to have people that have kind of been there done that Um, but also just older players who have a bit more experience because if you look down the squad you've got some of those I say older players they're all like 19 Um, not not old by any means but you've got Alexa Stonehouse, Fierce Mel, Karis Pavley, uh, Davida Perrin, Josie Graves who have all been to the Under-19 World Cup and Maddie Ward in, in there as well um, but then you also have younger players like Erin Thomas, Abby Norgrove, Ava Lee, who all could potentially play at the next Under-19 World Cup. So I think the balance is actually um, is really good. And of course, with a squad as well, you've got to get the balance of batters, bowlers, all-rounders, wicketkeepers, all that sort of thing. Um, so I think it will be a really good experience for them. And um, yeah, I suppose a, a chance for them to kind of prove themselves ahead of selection for the next World Cup. I mean, it, just, it sounds like a great trip. It sounds like absolutely brilliant. Uh, the thought of um, leaving the UK now to go to Sri Lanka uh, for a few weeks, it uh, sounds very, very, very appealing indeed. And I think as well, just thinking back to so many of those under-19s that we spoke to both before and after that tournament, just that process of meeting together, training together in Loughborough, and then going out and travelling together and being in that team environment being in those routines, it, the development that you create in that time is just absolutely amazing. So I think for people like Davina Perrin, be a second time doing this sort of thing, you know, you'd hope that she is being prepared, poss- you know, possibly to be a, well, certainly a senior member, maybe even captain of the under 19s in, in uh, just under 12 months time. Um, but then to have um, the, you know, people with experience of the 100, like Sophia Smale there, Alexa Stonehouse, those are going to be really, really good players to have as as part of that team. So I, I think it sounds absolutely amazing. I'm just really glad that the ECB are investing in, in this because I just think it, it makes the future of the women's game so much brighter when we're developing our young players in that way. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I was going to mention this before and the, the point completely uh, went past me but about a lot of them haven't had experience in senior cricket so a lot of these players play in the academies obviously a couple of them who we mentioned before have have played senior cricket but I just think if you're I mean the, the end goal is that you would want all these players playing for England the senior team of course not all of them are but if you can give them the experience of what it's like to be a senior England player when they're 16 17 18 I mean, firstly, it, it helps them decide if they like it or not, um, because I think that's the big thing. People people never know what to expect before they become an international cricketer and, and, and like until they do it. Um, but also it, it shows them how everything works. And I'd imagine they'll get treated similar to the senior team. Maybe they get nagged to do their homework a bit more. Um, but they they have that experience of, of, I guess, kind of being treated like a professional. Um, and although these are kind of just friendly games and stuff, it's a massive opportunity for them to show what they can do to, you know, they're in the England pathway. That's a that's a really big step. And I would imagine a lot of them would want to play senior cricket at some point this summer. Um, so it is very exciting and hopefully it will be relatively easy to follow. I know they're playing 
T20s and ODIs whilst they're over there. Yeah, yeah. Look forward to uh, to seeing that. And uh, yeah, hopefully there'll be some live streaming of, of those games. It would be great to see England uh, being successful, particularly against the Australians. Always. England have done it before. The legacy has to continue. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we introduce our guest this week? Yes, that would be great. She is a retired international player, but still plays domestic cricket. Yeah, so we've got Shauna Kavanagh on the podcast, who was absolutely fantastic to speak to. I always find it interesting when you speak to someone once they've retired or when they're near the end of their career, because I suppose they can really look back and reflect. And I think particularly for Ireland, it's been such a period of change. I suppose most countries, actually. But I think about Ireland and the introduction of professionalism um, and all those sort of things. And I guess the next five years are quite crucial for that as well. So enjoy our chat with Shauna. What's your cricket story and how did you first get involved with cricket? Yeah, I mean, probably actually similar to the answer most Irish people give you uh, in my family. So my dad played um, as kind of, I'd like to say, born into the cricket club. I didn't really have a choice. Um, so I was down there from, you know, when I was a kid and I was there all summer. So you either played cricket or you didn't, you were going to be there anyway. Um, and thankfully I was sporty. So um, I took to it, which my dad was delighted about. My younger sister didn't, she hates cricket. So um, he got one out of two anyway. But yeah, so generally just in the family um, and that's how I got into it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting. And it's, it's the same in England, really, is that almost yeah. everyone you talk to uh, gets into cricket because of a, a family connection to a cricket club and, and so on. Uh, but I guess maybe the challenge in Ireland and in England is how do you expand from that really, and how do you get people who um, who's who don't have a family connection to get into yeah. cricket? I know, I know, and it's a tricky one because, uh, and I think I, I might be wrong here. You can correct me. I think it's a little bit bigger in schools in in the UK. Schools here, it's not. Um, like even in my secondary school, I didn't want to play cricket. Um, it was such a poor standard and um, so you generally tended to opt for the other sports and um, so it's really not that big in schools here so it, it's kind of almost impossible to get kids I suppose at that school and um, secondary school age and um, I think it, there's definitely more primary school kids getting involved now like uh, Cricket Leinster which is the provincial one of the provincial unions here have been quite good in going out into you know primary schools and trying to get people um involved and then I know like Cricket Ireland have run these programs called It's Wicket and there's all these participation programs and to be fair I actually think they're working like there's definitely more kids involved now than there's ever been. Yeah I mean that's brilliant isn't it and I guess that you need to then try and develop infrastructure around it as well you know so where where my mum lives over in Tipperary it, you yeah. know I think even if you if cricket came to your school, th there wouldn't really be anything within a hundred miles for you to, to go to in terms of a no. Club. Well, not in Tipperary anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't. Is there is there a cricket club in Tipperary? I don't I'm, think I'm there not, is. We must no. have looked before to see if there is a cricket game yeah. when we're over there. But yeah. yeah, I mean, the only game we've seen in Ireland is is when we've had to come to Dublin to see them. Um, yeah, there are. I mean, yeah, I don't think there would be one in Tipperary because. And no, I was wondering it would be in Nina and there's nothing in Nina. So yeah. and I'm trying to think because actually, funnily enough, um so my husband actually works in cricket. So he does, he works on grounds and he would have gone around last year, kind of around Leinster, uh, assessing different grounds. And we were actually blown away by a lot of cricket grounds in counties that we didn't really know had cricket. And um, so that was really cool to see. And um, but off the top of my head, I don't think there was one in Tipperary. No, I mean, I there GAA, was, yeah. <laughs> GAA is the king, really, in, in Tipperary, you know. So yeah. We, we went to see Hurling when we were there last summer, and it was absolutely brilliant. Oh, okay. Well, it there, was, yeah, it's it one of the wild. homes of uh, Camogie and Hurling, so. Yeah, I guess yeah. also if, if you look at the Irish team, men's or women's, and you look at where players are either born or, or where they play their cricket, the majority of it is in Belfast or Dublin. So I guess that's, that's where the hubs are for cricket. And, I mean, hopefully that will expand, but... It's also difficult. And as you say, like with, with GEA and stuff that is so popular, I suppose in England, we've got rugby and football, which kind of dominate, but actually cricket is a, a lot bigger a sport. So it's easier. I guess it, it's more casually played, like people might play in yeah. the park. 
um, as they yeah. would with, with hurling or, or Gaelic football. Exactly. So, yeah, it's just exactly. it's all those challenges. I know, yeah. And it is a shame. Like, I think, obviously, it's such a big sport globally. So it's, you know, when, like, even if I'm in the office and now everyone now knows I play cricket in the office, but people are like, you play cricket? And I'm like, yeah, no, I play cricket. And they're like, that's so random. And I'm like, it's actually not that random. It's one of the biggest sports globally. Yeah, and I guess, you know, I mean, the, uh, as we, we've come to Ireland as a family over the last few years, Ireland is changing, isn't it? And is very much diversifying as oh, a country. I, and And I guess the more people from around the world come and settle in Ireland, a lot of them will have a cricket cricket expectation and and fandom with them. So maybe that is yeah. a is a way that things can develop as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, we've obviously spoken about about cricket in Ireland, but what was your pathway like in into the national team? Yeah, um, definitely a long pathway. Um, I think I remember. I think I was brought into it was at the time called an Irish development squad, maybe. Um, at the age of thirteen, so I was in it for a really long time. And um, that looked very different to what, you know, uh, an A team might look like now or, you know, even I suppose the women's under 19s now would be far more advanced to what that development squad would have been when I was 13. But that's, I suppose, the earliest memory I have of coming into an Irish setup. And then I remember going on my first senior tour when I was 17 and um, I didn't make my debut. I think I played against an ECB development 11, but obviously it wasn't a capped game. Um, and then I made my debut the following year um, at 18. So I suppose it was it, like I've been in the setup a really long, or I say I have been in the setup forgetting I've retired, <laughs> um, but I was in the setup for a really, really long time. Um, so yeah, it was a massive part of my life. And you played in three World Cups. Uh, which yeah. is which is brilliant, absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, starting in 2016. Now, I I guess if we look back on women's cricket in 2016, it it almost seems prehistoric now mm-hmm. uh, compared to how things have developed. Tell me a little bit about that World Cup back what eight years ago. Yeah, I remember being so excited because it was my first World Cup, and I was in India as well. So, like that was really cool. I'd been to India once before, and I'd gone on a, a training camp, but like. World Cups are just, you know, a completely different story. And for us, particularly because, you know, we weren't professional. We were nowhere really near professional at that point. And going to an ICC funded tournament like that, where they actually, you know, they do those tournaments really well. So that was, you know, amazing. We were getting our own rooms in the hotel and we were getting all these things that we just weren't used to getting. And when we went on tour, so that was kind of like one of my earliest memories I remember like I was like oh my god these hotels are so cool and we're staying in five-star hotels and um but yeah the the tournament itself I actually I didn't play a huge amount um I think I played one one game towards the back end of it but to be honest like that didn't really matter I was just so excited to be there at that time and uh, thinking about how cricket developed then over over the last well, eight years over those years of, of your career playing for Ireland what were the big changes that you saw going from your, making your debut right through to retirement? Yeah, I think, well, you know, obviously the biggest one in Ireland is the professionalism element. Like when I was younger, even that 2016 World Cup, I was working, you know, full time and then obviously trying to play, you know, international high performance sports on the side. And like I look back at it now and I'm like, I definitely wasn't a high performance athlete then. I, you know, I couldn't have been trying to juggle and balance everything. Um, and it was probably only towards the back end of my career when, you know, I got to experience professionalism full time. I realized how much you actually needed to develop as a cricketer. You know, people always used to say when you're amateur, oh, you know, you get up early in the morning and train or you train in the evening and you still put in the hard work and the commitment. But it, it doesn't really matter. You can put in all the hard work you want. Like you really need if you want to develop, you know, that much at something like you have to be able to give it everything. And. Um, so I suppose that's obviously the biggest thing in terms of professionalism. But I think like right across the women's game and even globally, like you look at the franchise tournaments that are there now. And I even look at it from an Irish perspective, like back in 2016, we wouldn't have had any players going to those tournaments. And now we've got, you know, one of our previous best players playing for Australia. We've got, you know, other girls on the existing team who are being picked up by franchise leagues and franchise tournaments and are making a name for themselves. Um, so I guess that's another really big difference. It is such an exciting time for Irish cricket, I think. And you've got 
you know, some amazing young players coming through, I think, at the moment. Who are who are the ones that really, really excite you? Yeah, I think I'm probably a little bit biased, but no surprise, Orda Prendergast, so she plays for my um, my club in Pembroke. So I've grown up with her, um, or I'd like to, she's grown up with me. I'm so much older than her. Um, but, like, I remember her when she was a little kid, and it's just, she, like, I look at her in the context of Irish cricket, and I know, obviously, Kim Garth is probably the most successful person to come out of Irish cricket based on what she's done and she's an unbelievable cricketer and I look at Orla and I think she you know I don't want her to go to Australia but she is that level of talent she's so good and she can excel on the world stage and be a standout player and so I think she's probably the big name that stands out to me. It was great last season when she came over to Western Storm and and just it immediately stood out as as a yeah. completely class player absolutely yeah. brilliant yeah absolutely and it's funny because that was with the bat and I suppose she unfortunately has been carrying a niggle for the last couple of years with her bowling so I don't actually think people have got to see how threatening and how unbelievable her bowling can be because she hasn't been able to do it consistently enough over the last two years but like that's another element to her game that just is on another level yeah, I was so happy when I saw her coming over for the Western Storm because I guess as well, being kind of the overseas player, there's that pressure that, you know, you have to perform and, and she did exactly yeah. that. And I saw her names in the 100 draft for, for this year as well. So yeah. we're really hopeful yeah. that she'll get picked up because, yeah. I mean, Gabby came over and, and played for Northern Superchargers and has had stints yeah. in our domestic system. So it'll be so good to get to get a couple more over playing in the 100. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, super exciting. I, you know, I, I can't wait to see her play in more of those tournaments. And, and similarly, like Gabby as well, and I know Amy Hunter hasn't yet been picked up kind of by those franchise tournaments, but I think like you look at her performance there in Zimbabwe, she's an unbelievable player and she's what, 16, 17 years old? Like it's, is she 18? I, I actually don't even know what age she is anymore. Um, But like there is just much more talent coming out of Ireland. And I think you know, now Irish players are making a name for themselves on the world stage and that's only going to help the game here. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, as you say, stepping up to the world stage, playing in in World Cups and uh, and taking part in franchise tournaments, it's absolutely amazing. And we we were really, really pleased to go and watch um, the third ODI between Ireland and Australia in, in oh, Dublin yeah. last summer. Yeah. And it, it was, a, you know, it's a great game, obviously, Australia. Australia no. won. Well, but, uh, but, well, but but it 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 wasn't a, a total mismatch, was it? You know, yeah. I mean Australia hammer everyone. No, time that's true. Time. And but actually, you know, you kind of held your own, didn't you? And there were some really, yeah. really good performances. Yeah. That yeah. Game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that was another thing. Like obviously there was that and I say hammer because I look at that partnership between I think it was Annabelle Sutherland and Phoebe Litchfield. Yeah. yeah. And I look at that. But actually, if you look at the individual performances and what some people did, it, it was actually really great. Like, obviously, Orla scored a 50. Um, Gabby put her hand up and scored runs as well in one of the games. And a couple of people scored, I think, 40s or 50s as well. And when you're doing that against the best team in the world, like, it gives you a lot of confidence as a player as well. We don't necessarily get to play against the best teams in the world all the time. So getting to play ODI cricket against them and actually getting to spend time out in the middle, seeing what you can do, and then putting in a performance I think is really important for our own players as well. And um, we'll chat a little bit about retirement, but firstly, who were kind of some of the key people within your cricket journey, whether that was with teammates or, or coaches from when you were younger? Yeah, I think probably first person was my dad because he played and um, he was a wicket keeper. So when I talk of wicket keeping late in life, he was absolutely chuffed. Um, but he's probably would have been the, you know, had the biggest impact uh on my early uh cricket years um and in terms of coaching as well actually a coach that's not involved anymore but his name is Nigel Pine and um, he would have been around in the I suppose those developmental years as well when I was uh younger and I I didn't have a lot of confidence as a cricketer particularly in those early years and yeah, I suppose he stuck by me and really backed me, which which makes a difference. Um, and like to be fair, there's a there's a couple of coaches I could name like that. My club coach Claire Shillington, who obviously played for Ireland as well. Um, and then to, like to be fair, my teammates like I had some amazing teammates who are like best friends of mine now. So Laura Delaney, and um, Louise McCarthy all probably played a really bit a uh, big impact on my career. Um, there's there's so many people you could name, but I think they're probably the standout ones. Yeah, I, I mean, 
and I guess now you're retired. So uh, from international cricket, I need to say, retired from international <laughs> cricket. Um, but uh, what's it what's it been like? Has that left a a, a kind of a, a sadness and a, a, a sort of gaping hole in your life, or can you kind of move on from that? Quite um, do you know what I'd say? It's a bit of both. So I really miss the sport. Like I cannot wait to get back and play for my club this year. Um, and I'm going to play some domestic stuff as well, so Super Series. And I'm really looking forward to that. Like, when I retired, it wasn't because I was sick of the sport or I didn't want to play the sport anymore. Um, so I definitely missed that part of it. Um, having said that, like, this is the first, I suppose, taste of freedom I have had. And I say freedom because of the commitment that it takes to play international cricket. But, you know, I've never known an adult life without cricket so it's been a really really interesting experience and I've really enjoyed it and um, obviously when you retire you're always worried how you're going to react and um, particularly when you're in it for so long uh, and even up until the day before I retired I didn't know if I was making the right decision if it was the right time but and um, thankfully it's been an easy enough transition for me um, I've been really happy and I've enjoyed, I suppose, just being able to focus on myself for a little bit. Um, but yeah, definitely miss the sport, really miss the sport. Uh, yeah, and I, and I guess for, for everyone that retires, you can still carry on as a fan, can't you? Uh, yeah. And that's and that's the great thing. And, and, uh, and to actually see where Irish cricket is at and almost like where you're leaving it in a, in a much better place than where you found it, if you like, it yeah, must, must be a really, really good feeling. No, it is. Yeah. And I know like a lot of people say that, you know, they always say they want to leave the sport in a better place. Uh, but it's true. Like there's, you know, I spent so much of my life committed to cricket and committed to cricket in Ireland. And um, so it's just really nice that it has progressed and come so far. Um, and whether, you know, my contribution was small or big or whatever that might be, I think, you know, every player that plays for their country at some point is a small cog in the wheel. Um, so yeah, no, it's really pleasing to see where it's at at the moment and just, I suppose, the opportunities that the girls are going to get now moving forward. It's amazing for them, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Shauna, it's been great to catch up. Thank you for uh, you know sharing your story with us. It's been great to hear it. I just want to wish you all the best in the insurance job, but also uh, <laughs> playing for your club this summer. I hope, uh, hope it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, it was lovely to chat to you guys. I really enjoyed speaking to Shauna. Yeah, it was really good. And it's made me determined to try and find a cricket club in Tipperary. Although I think I could be looking, I might have to start my own. I think I'll be looking for a while. Um, I'm sure, to be fair, there's plenty of grass. I'm sure we could pop one up somewhere. I think I think your grandmother's back garden might be the best place I was going to gonna say, I was like, that is probably the most played, like the, the spot that the most cricket has ever been played in Tipperary. Um, so, you know, maybe we could we could start something. Anyway, we will be back next week with another guest. In the meantime, in fact, you can hear me at 3.30 a.m. Uh, on Sunday morning. If you had... We didn't talk about that at all. Oh, yeah. Well, we did last week. Yeah, we yeah. We mentioned it, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm on commentary for Thunder versus Bangalore representative 11, who we don't know who any of the players are. So cannot wait to turn up and have to guess everything about them. Um, be like, oh. Short, short run up must be a spin off. <laughs> um, nothing gets past Sherlock over here. Um, so that'll be interesting. But yeah, three, it was originally 4 30 a.m., then moved to 3 30. So that would be uh, that would be a very good laugh. But you know, I think the more ridiculous the time is, if it was at 6 30, I'd be like, no thanks. But because it's 3 30, it's like, whoa, it's quite fun, you know? Um, mm. so yeah, that'll be uh be very interesting okay and you're popping home this weekend i'm popping home for a day um because mm -hmm. i'm becoming an exam invigilator probably the youngest in history to be fair everyone i've told that i'm doing it they're like oh all my exam invigilators were like grandmas i was like well you know i'm I'm trying to be uh you know paving the way for other young people in exam invigilation 
<laughs> Brilliant. And this time next week, you it'll be term over for you. Yeah, so I'll almost be on the way home for Christmas, which is the Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> wow. Wow. I've been calling it Christmas for the last <laughs> like oh, I don't know why. Um it's Easter. I know it's Easter. I do know my festivals. It is well definitely Easter. Um, mm. not Christmas. But um oh it feels like Christmas with the weather, so you know. So it's hard when you're living in Manchester. You can't tell the difference between seasons. This is um, true. So if people want to follow us and all that sort of thing, what do they need to do? You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, which is Naughty Child Podcast, and Twitter slash X, which is OHL Podcast. <laughs>